Although rulers throughout the ages have dreamed of a global empire, a quest for a global federation did not begin in earnest until Victorian Britain's roundtable groups proposed a commonwealth of nations. Today the commonwealth is known as merely a form of nations formally administered by the British Empire, but it originally was meant to be something far greater, as it started the drive toward today's regional framework. As a teenager, I heard John Kennedy's summons to citizenship. And then as a student at Georgetown, I heard that call clarified by a professor named Carol Quigley. Carol Quigley was Rhodes Scholar President Bill Clinton's globalist mentor as a noted history professor at Washington's Georgetown University when Clinton was a student there. Quigley detailed the development and objectives of the Roundtable Groups as part of his voluminous macro-historical text published in 1966, Tragedy and Hope, as follows. Cecil Rhodes fervishly exploited the diamond and gold fields of South Africa. With financial support from Lord Rothschild and Alfred Bate, he was able to monopolize the diamond mines of South Africa as De Beers Consolidated Mines. In the middle 1890s, Rhodes had a personal income which was spent so freely for his mysterious purposes. These purposes centered on his desire to federate the English-speaking peoples and to bring all the habitable portions of the world under their control. For this purpose, Rhodes left part of his great fortune to found the Rhodes Scholarships at Oxford in order to spread the English ruling class tradition throughout the English-speaking world. Rhodes and William T. Steed organized a secret society of which Arthur Lord Balfour, Lord Rothschild, and others were listed as potential members of a circle of initiates, while there was to be an outer circle known as the Association of Helpers, later organized by Alfred Milner as the Roundtable Organization. In 1909 through 1913, they organized semi-secret groups known as Roundtable Groups. In 1919, they founded the Royal Institute of International Affairs, Chatham House. Similar institutes of international affairs were established in the chief British dominions and in the United States, where it is known as the Council on Foreign Relations. Carol Quigley's research as a historian at Georgetown and Harvard, and his enthusiasm for the globalist cause, gain the confidence of sources within this movement in the United States. These sources allowed Quigley access to the historical records that were cited in Tragedy and Hope. Quigley's book was not meant to be an expose of the nefarious activities of the Council on Foreign Relations, or CFR, or its part in the semi-secret Anglophile network, but as a record for posterity of what he believed to be their grand effort, as he explained. I know of the operation of this network because I have studied it for 20 years and was permitted for two years in the early 1960s to examine its papers and secret records. I have no aversion to it or to most of its aims and have, for much of my life, been close to it and many of its instruments. I have objected both in the past and recently to a few of its policies, but in general my chief difference of opinion is that it wishes to remain unknown, and I believe its role in history is significant enough to be known. Uh, but it's good to have an outpost of the council right here down the street from the State Department. Uh, we get a lot of advice from the council, so this will mean I won't have as far to go to uh, be told uh, what we should be doing. And uh... It's good to be back at the Council on Foreign Relations. As uh, Pete mentioned, I've been a member for a long time and was actually a director for some period of time. I never mentioned that when I was campaigning for re-election back home in Wyoming. Quigley wrote that the roundtablers would allow portions of the British Empire, presumably Canada among others, to become part of a greater American Union in return for U.S. participation in their World Federation. From 1884 to about 1915, the members of this group worked valiantly to extend the British Empire and to organize it in a federal system. They also hoped to bring the United States into this organization to whatever degree was possible. Steed was able to get Rhodes to accept, in principle, a solution which might have made Washington the capital of the whole organization or allow parts of the empire to become states of the American Union. It is not surprising, therefore, that today's call for a North American community, being advanced by executive fiat with the U.S.-Canada Beyond the Border Agreement and its North American security perimeter, is being promoted chiefly by the Council on Foreign Relations and its representatives. Neither is it surprising that Rhodes scholar Bill Clinton would be groomed by that globalist institution to promote the pushing of the world's independent nations into 
an economic political network of interdependence and integration. As fellow globalist and CFR spokesman Richard Gardner wrote in the CFR journal Foreign Affairs in April 1974 entitled The Hard Road to World Order, the globalist network would have to make an end run around national sovereignty, eroding it piece by piece. Clinton's audacious ego is certainly consistent with the Rhodes Roundtable tradition. The extent to which the Roundtable moguls were full of themselves was revealed in their audacity to believe that their English ruling class had assumed divine authority to rule a global federation. Their disdain for other races' capacity to govern themselves was evidenced by Roundtabler Lionel Curtis, as quoted in Tragedy and Hope. Personally, I regard this challenge to the long unquestioned claim of the white man to dominate the world as inevitable and wholesome, especially to ourselves. The world is in the throes which precede creation or death. Our whole race has outgrown the merely national state, and as surely as the day follows night, or night the day, will pass either into a commonwealth of nations or else to an empire of slaves. And the issue of these agonies rests with us. These men had formed their intellectual growth at Oxford, on Edwin Burke's On Conciliation with America, and on the New Testament's Sermon on the Mount. The last was especially influential on Lionel Curtis, he had a fanatical conviction that with the proper spirit and proper organization, local self-government and federalism, the kingdom of God could be established on earth. When Lord Lothian died in Washington in 1940, Curtis published a volume of his speeches and included the obituary which Grigg had written for the round table. Of Lothian this said, He held that men should strive to build the kingdom of heaven here upon this earth and that the leadership in that task must fall first and foremost upon the English-speaking peoples. Contrary to Quigley's account, the Machiavellian means by which this aristocratic network would attempt to achieve its goal could not be said to be consistent with the Sermon on the Mount. There does exist, and has existed for a generation, before the 1960s, an international Anglophile network which operates to some extent in the way the radical right believes the Communists act in fact, this network which we may identify as the roundtable groups has no aversion to cooperating with the communists or any other group, and frequently does so. David Rockefeller, CFR honorary chairman and once longtime chairman of Chase Manhattan Bank, has confirmed this roundtable sentiment many times. Rockefeller has gushed praise upon the efficient administration of Mao's communist China that slaughtered an estimated 40 million Chinese and other authoritarian regimes as being a strong point for investment. The authoritarian, elitist nature of the Roundtable Network is further evidenced by the fact that Cecil Rhodes' role model throughout his life was a man named John Ruskin, as Quigley noted. Until 1870, there was no professorship of fine arts at Oxford, but in that year, thanks to the Slade bequest, John Ruskin was named such a chair. He hit Oxford like an earthquake. Ruskin spoke to the Oxford undergraduates as members of the privileged ruling class. He told them that they were the possessors of a magnificent tradition of education, beauty, rule of law, freedom, decency, and self-discipline, but that this tradition could not be saved, and did not deserve to be saved, unless it could be extended to the lower classes in England itself, and to the non-English masses throughout the world. Ruskin's message had a sensational impact. His inaugural lecture was copied out in longhand by one undergraduate, Cecil Rhodes, who kept it with him for 30 years. Ruskin was a prominent socialist of his time, whose sense has been widely interpreted by the academic aristocracy as a man with compassion for the poor, downtrodden masses, and for wanting to improve their lives by remaking society. However, the core of his belief was elitist to the point of advocating authoritarian subjection of those he perceived to be inferior for their own good, of course, as he himself summed up in his compilation of papers published in 1860 unto this last. If there be any one point insisted on throughout my works more frequently than another, that one point is the impossibility of equality. My continual aim has been to show the eternal superiority of some men to others, sometimes even of one man to all others, and to show also the advisability of appointing such persons or person to guide, to lead, or on occasion even to compel and subdue their inferiors according to their own better knowledge and wiser will. My principles of political economy were all summed in a single sentence. Government and cooperation are in all things the laws of life, 
anarchy, and competition the laws of death. It is no wonder that Ruskin's authoritarian, anti-competition teachings were embraced by the monopolist Rhodes and his group, as well as by the eugenics movement in England, the rise of which paralleled and intertwined with the roundtable movement within the British aristocracy. Eugenics, a proactive social Darwinism, enforced and accelerated Darwin's survival of the fittest. Darwin also was a Victorian elitist, and took Ruskin's authoritarian improvement of humanity into the dangerous realm of the biological. Today, it has been developed into transhumanism, the effort to fuse man and technology. The most disconcerting aspect to all of this was the elitist audacity to assume godhood and impose their English ruling class tradition throughout the world. Indeed, the religious element of this perfectibility of man was also in vogue in Victorian England during the late 1800s, particularly with the presence of occult practices in high society, paying homage to the serpent's perceived enlightenment that ye shall be as gods. Not surprisingly, Ruskin himself was a key figure in this development. Ruskin was a member of the Society for Psychical Research, as were Alfred Lord Tennyson, Arthur Balfour, Prime Minister 1902 to 1905, and William Gladstone, Prime Minister 1865 through 74. The SPR attracted many within British intellectual circles who had an interest in investigating the scientific credibility of paranormal activities. As an educator, Ruskin was noted for his emphasis in Romanticism and Gothic artistry. It was in this monastic, pantheistic nexus with naturalism and the SPR's attempt to rationalize the spirit world that Ruskin dwelled. Since art symbolism was of great importance to Ruskin, there is perhaps no better summation of Ruskin's life than the symbolism on his gravestone. Among the various esoteric symbols, the most striking is the swastika separating his birth and death years. Before Hitler made the swastika an obvious symbol of evil, it had been used for ages as a sun symbol in the occult and Eastern religions. It also symbolized good fortune, but like the yin-yang, the occult believed its force could also be utilized by the dark side. Indeed it was during that same late 1800s time period by such groups as Helena Petrovna Blavatsky's Theosophical Society. The Theosophical Society was openly Luciferian and used the swastika in many of its publications. Like all occult philosophies, both white and dark, theosophists promoted the idea of the ascendancy of man toward godhood through various rituals. For theosophists, these included Gnostic sacrifice and eugenics to achieve their ideal Superman. Hitler, their consummate eugenicist, and his inner circle were deeply into the occult. Hitler himself had been a member of the Thule Society and took its swastika symbol for his own. It is reported that he kept a copy of Blavatsky's writings at his bedside. He would give credit to American eugenicists, particularly the passing of the great race author Madison Grant, for being instrumental in his quest to develop the pure Aryan. 